Well, if you have your Bibles this morning, I'd like to ask you to take those out and turn with me to Revelation chapter 3, where we have been in a series in the book of Revelation, looking at the seven churches that Jesus wrote letters to. All different kinds of churches, and they happen geographically, if you looked at a map, to be along a postal route. And the way that these letters were addressed is that one church would receive a letter, but the others would all get to read the same letter to the other churches in their neighborhood. And as a way of doing that, Jesus wanted to communicate a full message, the number seven in Revelation, which appears all over the book of Revelation, is a number of completeness. It's, it's a number that shows us that it's a complete message that Jesus wants to speak about the many different kinds of churches that exist in Augusta County and in America and in the world. And so we've been journeying through this postal route and visiting these churches along the way and, and seeing what God wants to speak to us 2,000 years later from the time of the writing of Revelation. And I believe today... God wants to speak to us through this letter to the church in Sardis. A letter, I believe, has probably as much or more import for America and for the American church than any of the other seven letters that Jesus wrote. And we're going to see why in just a few minutes. But before we talk about Sardis, I, I want to just talk about zombies. <laughs> Uh, one of the most popular shows on Netflix in the past few years has been a show called The Walking Dead. I, I actually have personally never seen the movie or the show. But the main idea of the show, The Walking Dead, is something called a zombie apocalypse, all right? And a zombie is someone who is dead, acting like they're alive, only to do a lot of harm to other people. Really terrible things, as a matter of fact. So as, as I was doing some research, I found that there's currently 23 different TV shows and movies just on Netflix about zombies. So this is a really popular genre for some reason, it escapes me, uh, right now in our country. But all of these shows basically have the exact same plot, and it's this. There's something that we need to do, or there's something that we need to get over there, and it's over where all the zombies are. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, really, that's kind of like what all the shows are. It's like a soap opera. It's the same exact plot line all throughout. And so we're not here today. We're not going to be talking about zombie people, but we are going to be talking about the zombie church and zombie churches. So what is a zombie church? Well, a zombie church is a church that is dead, but that acts like it's really alive and it does harm to the people that are there and that are within its grasp. A zombie church thinks that they're doing all kinds of great things, that, that they're full of activity and life, but unbeknownst to them, they're actually completely dead inside. And of the seven letters that Jesus wrote to the seven churches, he's writing to this church in Sardis, and he's saying this basic message you guys are dead, and you need to wake up. You don't know you're dead. Other people don't know you're dead. Other people think that you are alive. But let me tell you, as someone who knows reality, you guys are dead, and you need to wake up. So today I want to talk about why churches die. I want to talk about what it looks like for a church to be in the process of dying or to be already dead and to not know it. And we're going to do an autopsy on a zombie church and the zombie church in Sardis. And I hope that in looking at this church today, that we are able to see ourselves individually and to see ourselves as a congregation and to recognize the places that Jesus is calling us out of our zombie experience and into life and life in Christ abundantly. So we're going to open our Bibles right now to Revelation chapter 3, verse 1. And we're going to look at Jesus' letter to the church in Sardis. A church actually which Jesus had nothing good to say about. Of the other churches, there were two that he had a lot of good, 
good to say. There were three that he had a mixture of good and bad, and there were two he had nothing good to say. No commendation, only correction. So buckle your seatbelt as we greet the church in Sardis. And to the angel of the church in Sardis write, the words of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars, I know your works. You have the reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up and strengthen what remains and is about to die. For I have not found your works complete in the sight of my God. Remember then what you received and heard. Keep it and repent. If you will not wake up, I will come like a thief and you will not know at what hour I will come against you. Yet you still have a few names there in Sardis, people who have not soiled their garments, and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. The one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments, and I will never blot his name out of the book of life. I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So a little bit about this city of Sardis. Sardis had a reputation of being a very wealthy and affluent and decadent city. If New York City and Las Vegas had a baby, it would be Sardis. <laughs> At one time, it was actually one of the financial powerhouses of the entire region of Asia. And part of that had to do with where it was located along a major trade route there in Asia. But Sardis was also wealthy because it had at one point in its history a gold rush and it had been enjoying the fruits of those gold and other minerals that they had found. Sardis though was very cutting edge. If they were a city today, they'd be the ones who invented cryptocurrency because they were the ones who actually invented coins, the kind of coins that we have used all of our life and are now somehow disappearing in, into somewhere, I don't know. But this was also a place that had other inventions that are important to the text that we're going to study this morning because they had developed the technology for dyeing wool, which was an incredible technology at that time in the world that they lived in. So Sardis was this place that you wanted to be if you wanted to experience wealth and affluence or to build those things in your life. But there was more that Sardis was known for. It was known for being a military power in the region. And the reason for that is because Sardis was built up on a cliff 1,500 feet above sea level. It was surrounded on all three, all three sides by sheer rock faces. And so the only way to attack and to overcome the city was one way. And so no one for most of its life had figured out how to overcome the impenetrable walls that surrounded the city. But all that changed in the year 547 BC when a man named Cyrus, who was the king of Persia at that time, came and laid siege to the city of Sardis for 14 days. They hung out outside the walls. They cut off all of the lines of resources for people trying to get into the city. And on the 14th day of the siege, one of the Persian soldiers was out hanging out by the walls, and he noticed that one of the Sardesian, I, don't, I guess that's how you say it, one of the Sardesian soldiers had fallen asleep, and when he did, his helmet fell off and rolled down over the wall into the ground below. The Persian soldier watched as the Sardesian soldier disappeared from sight, and a few minutes later appeared through a secret staircase and a camouflage door at the bottom of the wall. He popped it open, looked out, ran out, grabbed his helmet, and went back in, closing the door behind him. But by that time, the damage had already been done. That Persian soldier ran and told his superiors that he had found a way into this impenetrable city that no one else had been able to overcome. So Cyrus and his generals hatched a plan where they would send the majority of their troops around to the opposite side of the wall, and they would begin to attack. And as that happened, and the forces of, of Sardis went to that side of the city to defend it, he would send a small stealth attack up in through the door, through the stairs, and into the city. And guess what? 
it worked. Cyrus the Great, the Great from Persia was the first person to overtake this impenetrable, impossible military fortress in Sardis. Fast forward almost 200 years later, and another man named Alexander the Great came and with a very different approach, exposed a weakness in Sardis's defense. Within 300 years, this city that thought that it was beyond being able to be attacked had been breached two times. And all of this because of its lack of vigilance, its lack of being alert. It was overtaken twice by its enemies. Why do I tell you about these attacks? Because they're parables for what Jesus is going to speak about to this church. In every situation where Jesus speaks to a church, he's drawing on its past. He's drawing on its history of the shared experiences and values of that city and of that church to speak right into the interior of their heart and to get their attention. And it was the same exact situation in Sardis. For a city with a reputation of being comfortable and wealthy and secure, a reputation for being the model Greek city in all of Asia. But Jesus said, I know all that stuff. I know about all the appearances of your past and how you're living off of those today. And I want to come and let you know what's really going on, not just in your city, but in your church. And he said, I know your works. You have a reputation, Sardis, of being alive, but you're dead. Wake up, strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I have not found your works complete in the sight of my God. Do you know it's, it's, it's possible to actually be an organization or to be a church, to have done a lot of great things in the past, to have had heights of growth and influence, lots of money, great building campaigns, and to many years later be living in the shadow of all of those great exploits but to not have any substance of the life of Christ in your church. I, my dad grew up in, in a, an area of Pennsylvania where people used to mine slate. It was a hard blue collar town. And as you drive through that town, there's beautiful churches, just like the town that I grew up in. And when you visit the church that he grew up in, there are just a number of old silver-haired ladies sitting in the balcony and down below in this church. And you think to yourself, at one time, someone actually gave money to build this church. Somebody actually of their hard-earned time maybe even helped to swing a hammer. Someone believed in the vision of what was happening in that community. Someone contributed with their life and their resources to what God was doing. And at one time, that church was touching the neighborhood in which God had planted it. People was, people's lives were being touched. But now all these years later, the church was dying on the vine. And it was no longer a cathedral to God's glory, but it was a monument to something of the past. And this is where Jesus finds this church in Sardis. They have so much in common with the culture around them. At one time, great, but now just pretending to be something they used to be. And Jesus said, I have not found your works complete. In other words, I have not found all the things that you do to be enough in my sight. You have great things happening there. Maybe you have programs that you're still doing from 40 years before and committees that are meeting. And you're giving money here and you're giving money there. But the work of the gospel, the work of growing the kingdom is not taking place in your church. You're dead, but you think that you're alive. How many of you know that things like wealth and comfort and security and safety and fame and popularity, how many of you know that those things can affect a person spiritually? 
How many of you know that those things can affect a church spiritually? They can lull us into a stupor in our lives. I'm not saying that we can't be wealthy as followers of Jesus, but for many of us, money and the easy life that we often pursue often creates compromise and complacency in our life, and it pulls us away from the pursuit of following Jesus. See, the church at Sardis was no different. You can read all seven letters to the different churches. In Sardis, there was no threat of any outside attack on the church. There were no false prophets that were mentioned in this letter. No, no imprisonment. There's no heresy that was happening. This church, by all appearances, seemed to be thriving in their city. Everyone liked them. Everyone thought well of them. In other letters that Jesus writes, he talks about Satan, the adversary of the church, being at work. But Satan isn't mentioned once in this letter to Sardis. And I wonder if that's because Satan isn't worried about churches like Sardis. He, he's not worried about churches because they're not a threat to him. And actually, if he was to go and mess with them, they might wake up. They might actually rouse themselves and, and become a threat to Satan and to his work in the city there. See, that's why I think that Sardis potentially is one of the closest examples to the, to the church in America and to the church in the West. Because for us, for, for generations here, we have experienced peace and safety and comfort and wealth and prosperity. Thank you, God, for all of those things. But when we've put our trust in those things, they have, and they've had a way of lulling us into a spiritual stupor in our lives. Letting us think that the activities and the, the, the things that the Spirit did of yesteryear are still the, the way that God and the world around us sees us today. See, church, complacency and, and comfort, it has an effect on the church. There's a man named Tom Reiner, and he is a man who studies the church. And he said that of the approximately 400,000 churches in the United States, eight out of 10 churches, or 80%, are declining, have plateaued, or have died. 80% of churches. He said somewhere around 3,700 churches close their doors every year in America. And I've read that it's even more now because of COVID and what it's doing to the church. See, there's, there's so many things outside of heresy and violence, outside of Satan himself that come against the church that move us from being effective for God's kingdom to moving us into a place of being asleep at the wheel. And Jesus, he doesn't have time to allow his church to live in that place. He doesn't have time to allow you to fall asleep on something that he did 20 years ago in your life. He loves you too much to let you there, to let me where I am in my life. Let me tell you, each one of these speaks to my heart as I'm reading through these churches. I'm like, God, I have grown so comfortable in my life. I have learned, I was reading Romans 8 this week about the mind of the flesh, the mind fixed on the flesh is death, but the mind fixed on the spirit is life. And I said, God, my mind is so often fixed on the things of the flesh, my comfort, my safety, my family safety, and those aren't bad things. But when those things trump Jesus, they become bad things. So this speaks to me, and I, and, and I see in my own life this tendency to move toward comfort. I want it so bad. And when I do it, it moves me away from what Jesus called me to as his follower, which is a life of taking up my cross every day and dying to myself. And so as we talk about this today, I'm speaking to myself. Please don't hear me just preaching at you, the church. But I believe that Jesus wants to speak to us this morning about the risks are all around us and within us that if we're not attuned to, will lull us not just to a sleep, but into death itself. 
if we were to do an autopsy of this church in Sardis, I believe that there are four things that we would find that contributed to their death and their demise and that will contribute to ours as well if we're not careful. The first thing, if you're taking notes, is that the Holy Spirit had left the building. Now, we know that the Holy Spirit doesn't live in buildings. The Holy Spirit resides in us, that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. But the idea is that the Holy Spirit had left the church in Sardis. Look at this greeting with me in Revelation 3. The words of him who has the what? The seven spirits of God and the seven stars. Now we know that the seven stars are the angels of the churches. But what is Jesus talking about with the seven spirits? What's going on with that? To understand that we need to go back into our Old Testament and read from the words of the prophet Isaiah in chapter 11, verse 2. Look with me at what he writes. And the spirit of the Lord, one, shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom, two, and understanding, three, the spirit of counsel, four, and might, five, the spirit of knowledge, six, and the fear of the Lord, seven. Do you see those seven manifold manifestations of the ministry of the Holy Spirit that Isaiah speaks of here? It's the demonstration of what the Spirit does in his work. If you look up in the Bible and you read about the Holy Spirit and the work of the Holy Spirit, you won't find a single verse where the activity of the Spirit doesn't match up with one of these seven attributes that we read about. So there's one Spirit of God, but there's a sevenfold ministry. And so Jesus is the one that sends the Holy Spirit to fill believers He's the one who baptizes us with his spirit and fills the church with his spirit. Church, Jesus is not stingy with the spirit. If the Holy Spirit seems to have left the building in Sardis or seems to have left the building in your life or in this church, it's not because God is holding out on us, but because you and I aren't living the life of surrender and dependence on God, calling us, that he's calling us to live, to experience his infilling presence through the Spirit. So Sardis was rich and prosperous. They had everything that they needed, and they stopped depending on the Spirit of God. How many times that I've gotten up to preach, I've gotten up to do something, and I've done it all in my own flesh, in my own strength. I've been there. I've done that. I've led worship. I can do it. I'm fine. I'm not there in a posture of saying, God, I need your very presence to fill me so that I can speak your words and not mine. And this church had arrived at this place where they had started to depend on their past successes, on their natural abilities, on their financial security. You fill in the gap of what it is in your own life. See, the moment that we start doing that and depending on ourselves, we might as well close the doors to the church. The moment that it becomes about us and what we can accomplish, we might as well close the doors because it's really not about God and what he wants to do. See, church, we have to be spirit-filled believers. We have to be seeking his presence and his power in our lives every day, every moment. Zechariah prophesied to Zerubbabel in Zechariah 4, 6, and he said these famous words, it's not by might, it's not by your power or your great intellect or your finances, but it is by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. The first thing that we see on the certificate of death for this church is that they had not lived by the spirit of God. The second thing that we see is that they had no passion for prayer. They had no passion for prayer. If you want to take the pulse of any church, it's been said that you just need to find out the value that they place on prayer. How often do they pray? Is it the first place that they go or is it the last resort as a church? You know, we often say that prayer is important, but do we act like it in our lives? 
I remember back in the 90s, in the mid-90s, there was a powerful move of God in the United States at Brownsville Assembly of God. And I knew people who personally went to Brownsville to check it out. And, and they were touched by what God was doing at this church. There would be 2,000 people who would line up outside the church at six in the morning so that they could get inside when the doors opened at six at night. And this didn't just happen once. This happened over five years. People came from all over the world. They flew in to, to visit this place because they heard that God was moving in a powerful way there. And he was. There were recorded physical healings that were verified by doctors. There were deliverances. There were salvations. I even heard stories of prostitutes there in that city who were coming to Jesus through the ministry of that church. And granted, there was some wacky stuff that happened there as well. But let me tell you, there's always wacky people and they're wacky before they come to church. They're wacky before they meet Jesus and they're going to be wacky afterwards. But none of that diminished, but church, none of, that, none of that diminished the work that Jesus was doing in this church in Brownsville. In the five years that the revival took place there in Brownsville, three and a half million people came through the doors at that church. 150,000 people made a decision to give their life to Jesus Christ. There was something that God was uniquely doing at Brownsville. And I want you to hear this. The pastor of Brownsville at that time was a man named John Kilpatrick. And he said that he started with about 10 ladies. The church was a mega-sized church. It could, it could seat thousands of people. But he started, he said, with about 10 ladies and a handful of men who started to come early on Tuesday mornings to the church to pray, starting in 1990. And he said that they would walk to the sanctuary and they would touch and pray over every single chair. And they'd say, Lord, bless the person who sits here today. God, we pray that if they have bondage, that you would do a work, that you would set them free in their lives. And they would pray and they would pray. And then one day the Lord answered that prayer. Five years later, church, five years later, in a way that touched lives and touched nations and is still probably touching people today. And it was all because of prayer. Paul encouraged the church in 1 Thessalonians 5. He said, I want you to pray without ceasing. I want you to make prayer the centerpiece of your life. Communication with the Father Church, I want to encourage you to pray. I want to encourage us to be a people of prayer. On Tuesday mornings, we meet here at 11 o'clock. And there's a time of prayer that's led by Rennie and Marilyn. And people just get together to lift up the name of Jesus and to pray for this church and the community and the world. And on Sunday mornings, there's prayer that happens downstairs before the service. I want to invite you and remind you of the power of prayer to agree with what God is doing in our county. Why not Greenmont? Why not here? Why not a move of God here in our midst? And it all begins with prayer and a dependence on the Spirit of God and not ourselves. The third symptom of a dying church is that they no longer have an ear for truth. The Apostle Paul wrote these words to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 4. He said, the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. And they will turn away from listening to the truth and they will wander off into myths. Is this happening in our world today, church? Where people want to hear things that make them feel happy, but that lead them off a cliff. See, God desires your transformation and my transformation, not our happiness or our comfort. He wants a people who are transformed, not a people who just give themselves to luxury 
and feeling good by going to church. You see, the word of God and all spirit-filled preaching and teaching should comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. I know that sounds catchy and you've heard it before, but I think that there's something to that truth. To every church in Revelation, if you read every single letter, Jesus says this. He said, he who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Jesus is basically saying, listen up, pay attention to my words, not the words you want to hear, not the things you want the Bible to say to you for your own sake and comfort. Listen to me and then change, come back toward me and my words and the life that I'm leading you to. There was an article that came out of the Washington Post on January 4th, 2017, and it was entitled, Liberal Churches Are Dying, But Conservative Churches Are Growing. January 4th, 2017. The study looked at 22 mainline churches since 1960, and almost every mainline church, even the one I grew up in, had decreased its attendance in membership by at least 30%, some by as much as 50%. We're talking hundreds of thousands of people, millions of people who walked away and were no longer participating in those churches. And here's the the conclusion that the article arrived at. Quote, conservative Protestant theology with its more literal view of the Bible is a significant predictor of church growth while liberal theology leads to decline. I'm not here to beat up on any of our liberal Christian brothers and sisters, please hear me. I'm not taking shots. But churches with liberal theologies often no longer preach that the Bible is authoritative in someone's life. They often preach that that Jesus isn't the only way. He's one of many ways to God. They don't usually talk about heaven and hell or things like salvation. And oftentimes, I think as a result of that, and if we're not careful, the Holy Spirit says, guys, I'm I'm no longer going to, bless that kind of preaching. I'm no longer going to bless that kind of teaching, that type of cowardice and compromise in your culture. See, while those churches are dying, when the study looked at conservative Bible-believing, Jesus-preaching churches, what they found is that they were almost, almost all were growing. They were growing as a result of what they were preaching and teaching. Some of them were growing as much as 700%. So what does that tell us? It tells us that we need to be people of the truth who no longer longer just hear the truth, but respond to the truth of God's word, that we allow God's word to be an authority in our lives. And as a result, growth will come in our lives, in our church, and in the kingdom of God. I want us to be a church that continues to have an ear for the truth, where we contend together. We need one another. Sometimes some of us go off the deep end. Sometimes we wander off into myths and we need one another to call us back, to draw us back, to help center one another on the word. If you're a Lone Ranger Christian, you like to come here on Sunday, you enjoy the worship and the time together, that's wonderful. But I want to tell you there's a reality of walking together so close with one another that when one of us drifts, we can pull each other back. And boy, we need that. There, the things that are happening, the things that we are hearing with, with YouTube and the teachings that are going out in the church today, we have to be so careful. There are teachings that sound biblical, but that are new age and worldly in the church. And they will lead us adrift. So let us be people that have an ear and that hold on to truth. And the fourth thing that we see that was a sign of a dying church is that it tolerates sin in its midst. Do you remember what Jesus said to the church of Sardis in verse three? He said, remember what you have received and heard, keep it and repent and repent. Repent means to turn from our sinful behaviors and beliefs and to turn back to God. Church, God is the one who is the standard for our lives. Our culture is not the standard. Your friends are not the standard. What your family members mean both with their good intentions for you, the things that you read and hear, 
Those are not the standard. God and his word and his character of holiness is our standard. And we don't change the word of God ever to fit our needs or our lifestyle. We allow God's word to change us. You say, Seth, that's good old fashioned preaching. I know I've heard that a hundred times. But if that's happening in our lives, we will not err, we will not move, we will not become a dying church, but we will remain alive and vital before the Lord. So if there's an area of your life today, if there's an area of your life that you know of where you need to repent, I would say to you, do it now. Do it now. If you say, I'll do it later, I'll think about it after the service, I'm feeling conviction, but that may just be something I ate this morning, that burrito from 7-Eleven. Feeling some, indig- I'm, I don't know if that's conviction or indigestion. But what I want to be serious about and say is if God is putting his finger on something in your life today, he's doing it because he loves you, son and daughter. Do it now. Let him lead you back into repentance, back into the place of truth and life. If it's a relationship, if it's a way of thinking, if it's a grudge that you have, unforgiveness, if it's sexual sin, if it's something else, repent right now and don't delay. As we say in our house to our children, Delayed obedience is disobedience. If you're going to do it later, it's not obedience. It's disobedience. See, when you delay in obeying God's word, you literally grab Jesus by his kingly robe and you rip him off of the throne of your heart and you put yourself in his place. How many times have I done that? How many times have we pulled him off the throne of our lives when Jesus is calling us to repent? It's interesting that Jesus said that their spiritual vitality could return, not by doing something new that they had never done before, but by redoing something that was old, by returning and remembering, by going back the old way, the forgotten way. And Jesus says these words to them, and let these sit with you guys and let them shake you a little bit because they shook me as I read them this week. If you will not wake up, if you will not change your course, Jesus says, death is coming to you. You're already on its doorstep. If you will not wake up, I will come like a thief. You remember how those armies broke into your wall that you thought was impenetrable? You remember you thought that you were secure and safe and comfortable? I'm going to break into your life. I'm going to break into your church like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come against you. This is real. Jesus is, he's, he's extending the olive branch in the invitation to this church, to us. And he's saying, I'm, I'm calling you back, but if you don't, I want to let you know I'm coming. I'm coming for you. How many times have I got up in the middle of the night, walked around my house thinking from the noises of the trees that a thief was trying to break into my house, heart beating out of my chest, terrified, I know none of you will raise your hand, I'm the only one, (laughs) right? Thinking that it's about time to get into self-defense mode at home for my family. That a thief was coming. And Jesus is saying, I'm coming like that. I'm coming like that into your life if you don't take me serious. How many of you need to take it serious today? How many of you need to to repent right now? I'm going to hammer it because I just feel like it's what the Spirit's saying to us this morning. To make that turn because, because he wants to bring blessing in our lives. But it only comes from walking his way. So listen to what it says in verse 4 and 5. Yet you still have a few names in Sardis. Church, there's always a remnant. There's a remnant. There are those of you here, this church of people who are following Jesus with all their heart, who have not soiled their garments. They haven't stained their garments with sin and worldliness, and they walk with me in white. It's a sign of victory and purity, for they are worthy. The one who conquers will be clothed in white garments, and I will never blot his name out of the book of life. I will confess his name before my father and his holy angels.
It's time for us as a church to be fully awake. The world loves to talk about being woke. (laughs) But I'm talking about a different kind of woke. Being awakened to him. Being awakened to his voice so that we can hear him. Being awakened to his spirit. Being awakened to the prod of sin in our lives. Being awakened to the importance of truth. That we would take hold of truth and not let go of it. In a world that is being just thrown about by all of the things that are coming against it. We, his church, that we would not be shaken. And let us be watchful for church. He's coming like a thief, but he's also coming back again. Let's prepare ourselves. Let's get some white garments that are pure so that we can walk with him in the victory parade, right? They used to have these victory parades When the Romans would win, the generals would come out, they'd have white on and they'd have these wreaths around their head and they would walk and they'd strut. We beat them. And Jesus is saying, guys, come on, join me. I've overcome all of it. Come with your white robes and celebrate my victory. Will that be you? Maybe some of you need to turn your life to Jesus today for the very first time. Maybe you're here and you're saying, I need to turn my heart to Jesus. Maybe you're online and you're listening. And I would say, today's a great day to repent and become a part of Jesus' family. And for others, maybe it's the time for you to just repent and come clean before Jesus so that you can walk in white. Father, we just thank you this morning for your word. We thank you that it's in your blood that that our lives and our robes have been washed white. (laughs) We thank you that you love us enough to come after us wherever we are, whether we're in times of struggle and trial and persecution or whether we are in places of comfort and complacency. Help us. Help us to wake up and to be watchful. Thank you for this church. Thank you for the heart of this church to not rely on the things of our past to build a monument, but Jesus, to have ears to hear, to be led by your spirit and to see the very best days yet to come in your kingdom and what you're doing here in Augusta County through this church. We pray that we would be a people of prayer. Help me, God, I I need you to provoke me. Help us, provoke us to prayer. God, we would want to see whatever you wanna do and however you would wanna pour out your spirit in this church to touch the nations. We pray these things in your powerful name, Jesus. Everyone said, amen.